good afternoon everyone. Today we have a discussion about security. Even the Riga conference is about the security issues, but the security is so wide with so different angles that today we have a debate about individual cyber security. And for this reason, I uh, advised and I asked uh, Ms. Bai Bakashkin, general manager of CERT LV, to share some thoughts about uh, individual security and how we can build our individual cyber security with our every single step working with the computers, laptops, phones and being active in social networks. Hi, Baiba. Hello. So, as, as I already mentioned in the introduction, our main topic is to debate individual cybersecurity. Even it sounds very technologically, still I suppose you could share some practical hints and tips for everyone to consider how to make our life secure, being active in social networks, working with our online life, working with our computers and phones. Absolutely, uh, and I'm, I'm glad about this opportunity to discuss this topic because uh, internet really has become everyday commodity for almost everyone. And of course, security is something that we hear more and more of uh, because of uh, ongoing incidents and scandals. Uh, but before we go into particular tips and tricks, uh, let's say, uh, I think it's very important to uh, say that critical thinking is really the most important virtue that we have to develop and that we have to have in order to uh, be able to work securely in the cyberspace. Uh, critical thinking, and I would even say like slight paranoia, or uh, we, we should doubt almost everything that we do. And I know this mindset is not uh, the normal one for most people, but this is something that really, really helps to stay secure and not to uh, fall a victim uh, for different cyber uh, frauds and attempts to uh, steal your information. So critical thinking and to be more doubtful than maybe you would like to. These are really uh, things uh, that you first have to have in mind. And the next step would be that you have to be very much aware of what you do and why you do it. For example, if you uh, want to enter your internet bank and you know you do it, then of course you accept uh, the uh, smart ID authorization request. But if you haven't tried accessing your internet bank, then why would you accept? And such small details that you have to be aware of what you do, what are the consequences of what you do, and then act accordingly. Next thing that I would like to mention is that we have to uh, understand security and privacy, that these are two things that are very much linked, but they are not the same. And sometimes they are even opposite. If you want to more security, you have to give up more privacy and vice versa. If you want my, more privacy, you might be uh, in need to uh, look after your security yourself more. So these are also very important concepts that we have to be aware of. Next thing to consider, even before going to technical things, is what is at stake? Is my credit card a worse couple of euros that I only use purchasing small items on internet? Or am I transferring uh, thousands of euros invoice? So depending on what is at stake, uh, the level of my doubts should be different. Of course, it's good if you without everything, as I said before, but still, if it's a small purchase, then the risk is much smaller. If it's a big invoice, you have to check double if the account is correct, especially if your business partner uh, has mysteriously said, look, I suddenly had to change bank, please transfer to a different account. This is something that we have to be very, very careful about these days. And so only after you consider all these aspects, only after you think about your personal kind of level of policy, what do I do? online, what I don't want to do online, only after that you can go to technical implementation of those things. And of course, the most basic, the most important thing is how we secure our access to uh, our accounts, to our computer, to our email, to everything. And nowadays, two-factor authentication is the very basic. 
everywhere where we have a possibility to use two-factor authentication, it's a must. There is no question, no questions asked. Second, password manager, because there is no way we can remember all those passwords. So you have to have password manager, preferably on all devices where it's needed, and two-factor authentication. So this is one uh, basic thing without which it's very, very difficult to move on in the social life. Uh, regarding social networks, I think it's very important uh, to, to balance the paranoia part and the uh, part of uh, that we want to be a social beings, that we want to communicate with our friends. We have to uh, show what's new in our lives, especially uh, in the current situation when we can't meet in the real life as much as we would like to. And uh, again, I think it bring, boils down to the personal policy where you have to I, I'm not uh, one of those security experts who are saying don't use social networks, not at all. Many people do use them and that's normal. But um, when you do, be sure that you uh, have your own personal framework within which you operate. Is it uh, that you uh, put online only, uh, the, let's say the nature postcards or is it that you put online your children, your family, your trips, the levels are very different and you have to be aware of why you do it and that this information might leak, that it might be available not only to those people you shared it with, but to everyone. Are you comfortable with it? So those are basic questions we have to ask. Baiba, but you mentioned that, that we need to have the critical thinking. We need to have, I would say, some kind of positive paranoia so that we are really checking and, and having some kind of careful sense what's going on with our data, with our actions on the online. But also, uh, you mentioned several times personal data. And we know that, that personal data are being sold in, in the legal market. Uh, which part of my personal data I should really care about and should turn extra attention because this might be of particular interest for someone with a bad, uh, bad actually intentions? It's a good question, of course. And uh, I think that most people are most worried about data that are uh, connected with money. So the credit card numbers, the access to the bank account, maybe access to PayPal account and, and such information. So if we lose those, there is a immediate and direct risk of losing our money. And uh, there uh, are a lot of leaks where uh, such information uh, have been gone. Uh, good news is that uh, in these cases, uh, state police, also international law enforcement agencies are uh, employed and uh, they uh, do investigate these cases. Uh, the other part is, of course, if you have slightest doubts that your bank, uh, bank account details or credit card details are leaked, you have to immediately contact the bank. They will change your credit card number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are uh, basic things that are related to the money, the uh, asset that we can lose uh, the easiest. Uh, the next uh, thing uh, which can happen and is happening, of course, is uh, that we call stolen identities. That not only something related to our bank account is stolen, but uh, much more information about yourself, perhaps a personal code, perhaps copy of your passport, address, uh, uh, a lot of information. So much that somebody else can impersonate you. And that is already very dangerous. So in case of any doubts that this is happening, for example, uh, somebody is uh, trying to take uh, fast credit on your name. That is uh, something that we have seen uh, several times. This is, of course, straight, uh, straight way to go to the police and uh, try to stop this with uh, all the um, uh, uh, methods that law enforcement has at hand. If we talk about uh, vast majority of other data uh, that are related more to privacy, as we discussed before, like, uh, like your family pictures, like your travel plans, uh, like... Um, I don't know, assets that you have, properties, and so on and so on. I think this uh, really is um, very much related to how much we share ourselves. And if we have shared this information on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on other portals, somewhere else, then it is available to some amount of some number of people. 
and it can uh, go public. And we have to be comfortable with this. If, if we never share this information and this, is, this has become available somewhere online, then it is very worrying. And it might really mean that our uh, computer is hacked or our phone is hacked and somebody is accessing that information. Of course, there, is a, there are many, many ways to lose the information and there is no uh, single, uh, let's say, uh, cure how to uh, check if anything has leaked. Uh, there are portals where we can check if our passwords are safe, if they are not part of the leakages. Uh, we can enter our email address and then uh, see if there are any associate leakage uh, uh, entries. Uh, so there are a couple of things we can do, but there is no single recipe and we never know who is spying. <laughs> Of course, it is also related to the fact how, uh, how important the person is, uh, how interesting it is to, uh, let's say, other countries, to other uh, secret services. All these uh, things a person have to take into account and uh, consider when, when, uh, when you try to evaluate how much of your information can be uh, known to somebody else uh, somewhere around the globe. Okay, we, we, we as a human being somehow uh, accommodated to the, to the fact that we have computers, we have laptops, so from time to time we, we, we should renew the antivirus software and etc. Et but what about phones? Phones has become our best friends. So we are spending every single minute with, with our phones from the wake up call up to going to bed. And in many cases, we really do not associate any kind of security risks related to our phones. But, but in reality, phones are so useful gadgets in our lives. What about the phones? What we should take care in, in case of phones? Well, indeed, phones know so much about us. As you said, they are with us almost all the time. Uh, well, first of all, the good news. The good news is that, uh, well, speaking about phones, I have in mind Android systems or iPhone systems. Those are the most commonly used. Of course, there are some other uh, possibilities, but if we talk about these two operating systems, the good news is that they have been uh, built in, with security in mind. So there are a lot of features that really uh, take care in, instead of the user uh, for securing his access, for preventing unauthorized software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the first uh, rule of thumb is that we uh, use only the software that is available from the official stores. So it's Google Play and Apple Store. Uh, the second part, of course, is that we do not uh, try uh, to attempt to root the phone, so to overcome the, per uh, the built-in permissions. And uh, this, are, this is the basic, really. And then on top of that uh, should come other uh, security uh, methods depending on what we do with our phone because the way we use it is very different and this again links back to our personal policy it is very good if the person uh, thinks a little bit what do i do with my phone will i have email on the phone some people do some people don't will i have access to my internet bank from the phone some people do some people don't social networks pictures and, and once you understand what you use your phone for, then the level of um, protection, of course, must be different. If you use it for work, if you connect uh, from the phone to work systems, then there must be antivirus software on the phone. And uh, some organizations also provide um, the global uh, security coverage for also mobile devices. If there is no such uh, policy and no access to the uh, systems at work, then uh, the uh, requirements can be also a little bit lower. Uh, what is also important uh, is to look at the permissions that applications are asking. When we install application, it asks for a set of permissions. And uh, I mentioned about the official stores. Of course, there have been cases, not just single case, but more than that cases when uh, they overlook something and malicious software is available from the store. Luckily, it is revoked quite fast usually, and then mm, users are notified. Uh, but still, there is a danger that you, even from the Google Play or Apple Store, you can get uh, software with built-in some malware features. And uh, this is not easy to spot. So there can be uh, cases when, when this happens. 
Uh, what can make you suspicious is if you perhaps uh, install something very simple and it asks for all kinds of permissions, access to everything, then you might ask why, why would this software need that? And am I comfortable with this? If I'm not comfortable with this, maybe this is not application I really want to have on my phone that would access my camera anytime, microphone anytime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in the newest operating systems, the good news is that you can deny. You can deny, for example, access to microphone, you can deny access to camera. So those are things that we can influence ourselves if we just a little bit think of what we are uh, actually doing, what we are installing. But it's not easy. I can agree with that. <laughs> it's, it's not easy at all because listening to you, I have a feeling that the most secure way is to switch off my phone, which of course then would create rather huge problems for my daily routine. Uh, not at all. Not at all. That's not needed. <laughs> okay. But uh, besides phones, uh, another, another issue we use uh, very much is emails. So we are somehow dependent on emails. and. Uh, I should admit that many people uh, from time to time receive heartbreaking emails or email letters from princes in some continent or the doctors in war zone or the person who just yesterday become a millionaire. And all those people are writing long, long lines of heartbreaking messages asking for help to accumulate million, millions and millions of, of, of money. Just what you need to do, just transfer some kind of money to, to certain account. So, uh, of course, we see this as something that they are trying to get our money. But what is the smartest reaction to all those heartbreaking emails? What you would suggest for everyone? There is a very, a very uh, handy button for that, and it is called delete. <laughs> oh. That's the button you should use in all these cases, and it solves the problem immediately. Uh, that's that's the simple answer. Uh, of course, there are cases uh, when when um, scammers are not only emailing you, but they are also calling or trying to connect uh, via WhatsApp or some other programs. But there are again means you can uh, block the number, you can uh, not just ignore and not answer. Uh, but this really brings uh, brings down uh, the question: Are you a really individual target, speci specifically selected? for this scam, or uh, is this targeting hundreds of hundreds of people and they just wait which one will uh, respond. If this is the latest case, when you are just one of hundreds and hundreds of targets, then deleting and blocking is, is just fine and you are never hearing of them again or you're hearing about from the next prince. Uh, if you are individual target for some reason, either because you are rich or because you have access to some information, then of course, of course it can be much, much more tricky and the, um, the fraud can be very much uh, uh, tailored for you. So they can uh, learn what you like, what you do, and the threat can be uh, much, more, uh, much harder to recognize. For example, if the weak spot are homeless animals, then this threat can be formed around this topic. And you are, uh, you know that you, you donate a lot of money, let's say to homeless animals. So uh, this, uh, this might be uh, some uh, uh, area where it's harder to recognize that it is uh, not, uh, not something good that you can do, but it is actually uh, another fraud and uh, uh, attempt to uh, get your money. Uh, but if, again, critical thinking is the only thing we can use here. And the other thing that we have to remember is that such kind of frauds are not new. They are uh, as old as the world. They've been here uh, when, when we didn't have electricity and uh, email and internet, none of that, and still people were cheating on each other. Now just uh, they are just much more enabled and there is a much bigger audience available to cheat from. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but uh, in this context, of course, uh, yes, cheating is showing us, let's say, bad side of humanity. And of course, uh, we are human beings. We have our own habits. But in this context, of course, our daily life has changed recently because the online life has increased dramatically. And now we are facing uh, such issues like e-work or telework, which means that we are working remotely. We are 
actually dealing with e-business, that, that yes. all client to client or business to business communication goes on remotely. But also we are having e-health or telemedicine. So, and this latest issue, I mean, e-health or telemedicine includes also our personal communication with the doctors, with the hospitals, and it also changes our relations with the healthcare system. If there are something you want to, let's say, emphasize regarding this issue, we should be aware about, or maybe what are your forecasts, how these tendencies will grow up within the next months? Well, security in the medical uh systems and, and um, organizations is a very hot topic. Obviously, uh, pandemic situation has increased the heat in that, but also uh, before the pandemic, uh, the NIS, Network Information Security Directive of European Union, um, designated uh, healthcare as one of the critical sectors. And because of that, in many, many countries, uh, there has been a much more activity ongoing uh, in regard of understanding the security level of hospitals and uh, healthcare institutions, uh, of um, understanding how to increase that level, how to uh, prevent uh, all kind of threats that uh, that actually can uh, impact our uh, experience in the hospital. Not only uh, meaning of telemedicine, uh, but even the real medicine. And we've heard uh, about cases where uh, hospital uh, IT systems um, are encrypted. Uh, the hospital is asked to pay ransom and they are not paying, but they cannot accept patients. So these are all uh, things that we face currently. Uh, and it is worrying, I must admit. Uh, the good news is that in Latvia, uh, we, we haven't had any major incidents related to healthcare system so far. Uh, there are a lot of uh, procedures that allow fallback to uh, working without uh, IT systems. So this is uh, also good news in this respect. Uh, but uh, when, we, when we look uh, wider, uh, then of course there is no, uh, no one size fits all solution. And the, the, the problem itself is, is not trivial uh, by any means. Uh, in the long run, uh, there are again European Union um, uh, movements, let's say, uh, to uh, imply security certification of products, for example, uh, to put more responsibilities on vendors so that they are responsible for patching and updating equipment when uh, some uh, vulnerabilities are found and it will have to be for longer period than it is now. Uh, in general, uh, systems that are built now, of course, they will be more secure than those that we are using that are built five years ago and 10 years ago. Uh, so there is no, no easy answer to this question. Uh, I know that in many cases, we don't have a choice as well. If this is the way we can connect to doctor, even if we don't think it's the best way or most secure way, we still need the consultation with the doctor. So we are not the ones who will say, no, no, I will not use Zoom. I don't like Zoom. <laughs> if I want to see the doctor and I cannot do it in, in a, a physical uh, place, then, then it's not up to us to choose. Uh, but um, I, I think that this is really a hot topic and solutions are coming. It's not, uh, not negative. Uh, uh, ending of this uh, long <laughs> analysis, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, positive thing is that, that uh, as, as uh, every single day we, we are facing new challenges, we are also facing new solutions. So uh, hopefully we will also have uh, new approaches and, and maybe after a year our, our concerns about, about some uh, cyber security issues in telemedicine will, will, will seem for us just so, so simple, so simple, how we could worry about. But uh, uh, finally, I also wanted to ask you, we have heard about the social engineering attack. To what extent ordinary people like me should worry about this? Would I be the, the target for social engineering attack? And what harm social engineering could create actually? Uh, this I think uh, nicely comes back to what I, I discussed at the beginning. Uh, to understand uh, our personal policies, what we uh, do, and also to understand our assets. What do we have? Uh, 
do we have access to something uh, interesting, to something sensitive? Uh, do we have access to uh, money, for example, not personal money, but companies' money? Uh, can we authorize transfers to that? Uh, do we have uh, access to personal data of other people, for example, telemedicine and, and patient data and so on and so on? Uh, and depending uh, on, on how much valuable uh, assets you have access to, you are more likely to be a target of social engineering. I would say that everyone can be a target. But again, the difference is, are you the target of attack which is launched to hundreds of people and they just wait which, which one will respond or is it really very carefully crafted attack for you? I would say if it's a very carefully crafted attack, it's very uh, likely that uh, we will fall uh, victims. It's very hard to really uh, withstand such attacks. There must be very thorough training for that and, and very high level of paranoia. If, on the other hand, this attack is targeting many individuals, uh, then uh, if we just use again the, the level of doubt, if we don't respond to things that we are doubting about, if we don't break our personal policies, for example, never uh, changing uh, passwords uh, for employees uh, uh, during the evening and, and so on, just an example, uh, then, then it shouldn't be uh, too dangerous. But again, if it's a targeted attack, very hard. Thank you, Baiba. I have a feeling that, that regarding our individual cybersecurity, we, would we should follow like it is in the Latvian proverb, seven times measure and only one time to cut. Absolutely. That's a very good, uh, good uh, conclusion. <laughs> well, of course, we could rephrase it. So seven times to evaluate before you share your data and then one wants to do. Uh, thank you, Baiba, for being with us. Just to remind, so today we have a debate with Ms. Baiba Kashkin, general manager of CERT. LV, and this debate was led by Iva Treinhold, a professor of University of Latvia. Thank you.